Hello, and welcome to lecture number 11 in our ongoing series in Drugs and Human Behavior. Uh, today we are continuing our discussions of uh, addiction and uh, the processes involved in addiction. In particular, in this lecture, we're going to focus on the reward pathway. And the reward pathway is critical to understanding uh, addiction, why some people are more prone to addiction and others are not. So here's where we are in this series in uh, this section on epidemiology and neurobiology of addiction. Uh, in the next uh, lecture, we'll actually get into more details about how uh, we go from abuse to addiction and also talk about how uh, epigenetics might be involved in that as well. So we'll start with the uh, reward pathway. We'll start off talking about the critical role of dopamine. This is often called the dopamine system or the dopamine reward system. Uh, to provide a brief review of the, uh, or overview, sorry, of the reward pathways. And then finally talk about how this all works in talking about the functional neuroanatomy of the reward system. So it all starts um, with dopamine. So the reward system is one of the major dopamine pathways in the brain. We have uh, significant dopamine productions. Uh, involved in the reward pathway. As I said before, it's often referred to as the dopamine reward system. A couple of key areas we're going to talk about is the ventral tegmental area, or the VTA, the nucleus accumbens, and the frontal lobes. The nucleus accumbens is particularly important because this is the part of the brain which gives us our sense of reward. In uh, rat studies, if you place an electrode in this and electrically stimulate it, rats get very addicted to that sensation. So this is the part that's giving us that feeling of reward. For uh, drugs, all reward properties of drugs are tied to dopamine. So traditionally, dopamine increases in response to natural rewards, food, water, sex, that sort of thing, um, part of our natural rewards, and we get a nice little dopamine rush. Uh, cocaine provides a nice gigantic dopamine rush and so is what we call an artificial and exaggerated reward. Uh, so drugs that um, directly increase synaptic dopamine levels include nicotine, uh, cocaine, and amphetamines. Other drugs uh, indirectly decrease or increase dopamine uh, by inhibiting uh, the effects of GABA on dopamine neurons, and these include the opiates and alcohol. So they have the rewarding properties indirectly, by increasing dopamine release, whereas nicotine, cocaine, and amphetamine directly increase um, their, the amount of reward, sorry, the amount of dopamine, thereby directly increasing uh, the feeling of reward. So next, we're going to talk about um, just a general overview of the anatomy involved here. Um, there are some key areas we'll talk about. We'll first talk about the role of the hypothalamus in sort of natural rewards and uh, consumatory behaviors. We'll then talk about the mesolimbic pathway and then the mesocortical pathway. And these are two important parts of understanding how this whole reward system functions. Let's start with the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is critical for a lot of motivated behaviors such as eating, drinking, uh, thermal regulation, and sex. So going out and finding food, water, getting cool or warming up, and also finding sex are basic motivational behaviors. So part of our initial um, built-in drives. Hypothalamus is primarily uh, involved in consumatory behaviors, not goal-directed behaviors, and that's an important distinction because oftentimes um, drug rewards are far more involved in these sort of goal-directed behaviors, going out, finding drugs, um, getting that reward, etc. Uh, we do know that activation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis during times of stress can trigger needs for reward. And that's something that's very important to understand is stress can oftentimes be a trigger for drug use and drug abuse episodes, particularly for people who are trying to recover um, as addicts. Uh, stressful situations can push them back into drug use. And so it's very important to keep an eye on uh, friends that you might know who might be vulnerable to this kind of um, problem. So that gets us then to the mesolimbic dopamine pathway, uh, primarily involved in the limbic system, involving the ventral tegmental area, the nucleus accumbens, a little bit of the amygdala, 
So if we look here, we have the ventral tegmental area here uh, at the top of the brainstem and the tectum, the medium forebrain bundle, and then the nucleus accumbens, and then the rest of the limbic system, including the, hypoth or, sorry, the hippocampus, uh, the amygdala, uh, etc. So we'll start with the vent ventral tegmental area. It's on the midline floor of the midbrain. It receives input from the subcortical attention system. That's an important part of understanding how attention-related cues might be related to uh, rewards. So oftentimes, drug-related cues can direct people's attention more towards the um, idea of uh, drug consumption. The nucleus accumbens, sorry, the medium forebrain bundle, somehow these got out of order, uh, is a bundle of dopaminergic neurons which connects the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens and the limbic system. And so um, this is a connection between the VTA, uh, the nucleus accumbens, and the limbic system. The limbic system is going to be involved in memory for uh, drug rewards, learning about drugs, learning about rewards, how we go out and find rewards again, um, remembering drug abuse episodes. And the nucleus accumbens, of course, is going to be involved primarily in our feelings of reward. This is part of the ventral striatum. This is where all of our feelings of reward are generated. And so when we're um, rationing up the nucleus accumbens, we're getting uh, larger and larger feelings of reward. Then in the limbic system, uh, the medial forebrain bundle projects to the olfactory tubercle, which innervates the septum, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. And the amygdala is, of course, involved in our emotional responses, and the hippocampus is involved in um, memory, learning, etc. And so it also uh, has important roles in top-down regulation of the HPA axis. So anything that might damage the hippocampus can actually alter our responses to stress. And so when we start talking about the, ro the role of stress in drug abuse, uh, this becomes an important part of that. That gets us to the mesocortical pathway. It starts at the ventral tegmental area and then travels upward to the prefrontal areas, the cingulate and the pararhinal cortex. Uh, these important things include um, motor functioning, uh, compulsion, perseveration in the frontal cortex. Our ability to assess risk is uh, particularly important. In fact, we know uh, drugs like cocaine and amphetamines alter our perception of risk, and so that's one of the important behavioral uh, aspects of these particular drugs. We also know, uh, and it's important to note, and we'll talk a little bit more about this here in a moment, that the frontal lobes are involved in what's called working memory. And working memory is our ability to manipulate and work with information, but also to actively inhibit information. And so people with strong working memory can inhibit things like um, drug cues. And so what we see is that people with uh, high levels of working memory are at less risk for drug addiction. While they may still use drugs, uh, they are often what we call weekend warriors who are able to resist the urge to do drugs while they have other things to do. Then they go out on the weekends, party it up, and then go back to work on Monday. Uh, it's that high level of working memory that allows them to do that. Now, the open question is, the longer they do that, uh, will they still have that high level of working memory? And that's an important thing to consider. So we'll talk then about uh, how this works we call the functional anatomy of the reward pathways. We'll talk first about the reward prediction error signal, uh, then incentive salience, reward euphoria, and then anticipation of reward and habit formation. So let's start with, start with the reward prediction error signal. Initially, dopamine neurons in the ventral tegmental area respond to the presence of a reward. So these neurons only respond when the reward is given. But if a sensory cue predicts that reward, those dopamine neurons fire in response to the cue, not the reward. Now, if we go back to first principles, remember um, how uh, in basic uh, operant conditioning, you can condition an animal to respond to a cue rather than the reward itself. This is the entire basis of clicker training with dogs. That clicker is associated with the treat reward, and so that clicker is actually providing the same sense of reward in the brain. That's why clicker training works, is because of that. However, if a reward fails to occur, those dopamine neurons will decrease their firing. And so you do have to occasionally pair that clicker with treats as well. 
we also know is that an unexpected reward results in a higher dopamine release and greater learning. Now, the sort of functional part of this is if you find an unexpected source of food, water, sex, it's important that you remember that because that's an important survival aspect when you're trying to learn how to find food, water, and sex is what are the things that result, result in that. Now, when it comes to um, drugs, unexpected drug use, unexpected um, uh, rewards can uh, result in greater learning. And so oftentimes they're overrepresented in sort of our learning uh, pantheon. So this is how we start to associate cues with reward. And again, in drug abuse, we do know that certain cues are associated with triggering drug abuse episodes. And in fact, oftentimes in uh, research settings, we use cues to see how people are responding uh, to things like medication. And so a drug-related cue might be for somebody who uses cocaine, you might show them a picture of a pile of cocaine, um, the stuff you would use to snort cocaine, a straw or a bill or whatever uh, people are using. And so those cues then get associated with that reward and then uh, reinforce that behavior further. Incentive salience um, occurs, the uh, mesolimbic pathway enhances the motivational properties of cues that are predictive of rewards. So we're more motivated to go out and find those rewards. And so that's why it's called incentive salience, um, because we're incentivized to go out and find those rewards. And also, um, we are more likely to pay attention and those cues become more salient. So that motivation is associated with activation of the amygdala. This property, again, is referred to as incentive salience. These motivational states then increase the incentive salience of reward and related cues. That is, we are more likely to be able to find them or more incentivized to go out and find them for uh, that reward and cues that are associated with it. And so this is an important part of, again, how we try to figure out how to find food, water, etc., but also can be associated with motivational states that increase the salience of reward and related cues. So if somebody's trying to find drugs, they may be able to focus more closely on people's behavior, trying to see if somebody else is doing drugs, uh, etc. Reward euphoria, then, this is where the high from our reward comes from. This comes from the nucleus accumbens. Most research in this area involves cocaine and amphetamines because they both cause substantial increases in synaptic dopamine. Blockades of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens decrease the reinforcing effects of um, rewards in animals. I do want to say for just one moment, uh, and this may actually be later on in the lecture, but I, I would be remiss to not say it now. Um, one of my criticisms of research in the reward pathway about things that aren't drugs, Facebook, Candy Crush, people get addicted to video games. They all say Facebook's just like cocaine. It's not. Um, and I think that's really important. Yes, it involves the same brain areas, but it is not the same as cocaine. Um, and I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Don't buy all the hype. That gets us then to anticipation of reward and habit formation. There are reciprocal connections from the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus that drive anticipation and craving. And so uh, we're able to control those cravings um, or anticipate uh, drug use based on these connections from the frontal lobe. As I was saying earlier, reductions in executive functions such as working memory can contribute to the incentive salience of drugs and other artificial rewards over natural rewards. And what that means is that if our working memory capacity is reduced, then we are more likely to focus on artificial rewards rather than natural rewards. Now, how does our, how our executive functions get reduced? Primarily through stress. In particular, high stress situations cause the release of cortisol. Cortisol reduces our executive functioning, and that stress then can lead us to seek out artificial rewards over natural rewards. And so stress, you're going to see throughout the semester, is a really critical part of mental illness, in particular drug use and depression. So these reciprocal connections from uh, the frontal lobe have exert both top-down and bottom-up influences uh, on this entire pathway and are an important part of our ability to control things like drug use. I want to end then with some uh, quick discussions about our differential vulnerability to addiction. 
The first critical thing to understand is stress is an important factor when it comes to drug, drug use, drug abuse, and in particular, drug addiction. Because people who are under high levels of stress, chronic stress, are at much greater risk uh, for drug use because they're much more likely to seek out artificial rewards over natural rewards because that stress has reduced their working memory capacity or their executive function. And so it's a critical part of understanding how people end up abusing drugs is because of stress. And it's one of the things I mentioned in the previous lecture that we are facing an opioid crisis that of course has a lot to do with the availability of these drugs, but also has to do with the nature of our society. Um, I think we all can agree that things are much more stressful than they used to be. And I think that's something we need to be mindful of. Social context. This is another really important part of understanding addiction, in particular, social support, in particular for people under stress. So in the early research on cocaine uh, with rats, they uh, used rats that were kept in cages, uh, brought them out, brought them to um, have, uh, gave them access to cocaine water. Uh, they were very motivated to get to that cocaine water every time they went back to it. But rats are not solitary creatures, much like people are not solitary creatures. And so in later research, if the rats were in a colony with lots of other rats uh, to hang out with, they went back to the cocaine water on occasion, but not um, chronically or in an addictive fashion. That social context blunted the need for that drug because they weren't as stressed out. Finally, genetics and epigenetics, and this is an area of emerging interest. Um, probably the clearest uh, area that we can see this in is uh, in nicotine addiction. There appears to be uh, one particular genotype in what we call hardened smokers. Uh, for people that are uh, much more uh, addicted to nicotine than others. And so how people respond to a particular drug probably also has a, um, something to do with their genetics. We'll talk more about epigenetics uh, in the next lecture, but we do know, uh, based on animal research, that drugs can change genetic expression in an individual, and that can be passed down to uh, subsequent generations. What's interesting about that in a study on uh, cocaine in rats they discovered that um, if you gave cocaine to a rat, its grandchildren liked cocaine less compared to other rats. And so they were actually less likely to use cocaine than um, rats who did not have that epigenetic alteration. Um, what that alteration is is not particularly clear, but particularly interesting. All right, well, that gets us to the end of the reward pathway. Hope you found that interesting. We will pick up next with um, From Abuse to Addiction.